What a beautiful crowd. I am so tickled. Sorry, I'm um I'm perusing right now. Such a <laughs> wonderful turnout. Okay. Well, I don't want to take up too much um, time because we have such a phenomenal person here with us presenting. And um, before I introduce her, I am going to shrink my screen here. Welcome, people. We're so honored that you could join us. Okay, so give me just a moment and then I will start my introduction. And I am, man, technology. All right, so we are just about, all right. So um, greetings everyone. Uh, my Klinkit name is Dach Gil uh, My English name is Colleen James. And I am a guest here in the Ak Kwan territory. Um, people who are familiar with the language uh, will see or hear that Kwan uh, means people of, and Ak is small lake. So I want to um, take a moment to acknowledge whose land we're on here in Juneau. Um, my family and I are so thankful. We have so much gratitude to the Ak Kwan. Um, I am Ta or Tantaquan. Um, I come from Ketchikan and Metlakatla. Um, Tanta or Tan is sea lion and Kwan is people of. So my people come from people of the sea lion. And I know that my family and I are guests here in the Ak Kwan territory. Um, they have been beautiful stewards of this territory for thousands of years. And we just say Gunnachish for being such gracious hosts to all of us. Um, my title, I am the Student Equity and Multicultural Services Manager. Um, I run the Native Moral Student Center at the Juno campus, and it's my honor to work with all of our students here. And um, tonight is kind of a, a special treat for me. I'm not usually the person who does the welcome for um, this evening at Egan, but um, I'm so tickled that I was invited to introduce tonight's guests. We have Irene Dundas. She is from Cake and she lives in Ketchikan. And um, a little bit of information about our relationship. Uh, Irene has been such a beautiful guide uh, to the Tantaquan people, um, to the Ghana Hadi people. And um, my family is part we're part of the Ghana Hadi, my mom and I, and Irene has done such a beautiful job helping us get connected to our history, our ancestors. Um, when we need to uh, figure out genealogy, uh, Irene is so fantastic. She's such a wealth of knowledge and she is such a treasure to our people. And so um, I am honored that we get to spend the evening with uh, Miss Irene Dundas. Um, I am going to turn it over to her and I'm gonna turn my screen off. But before I do that, I just wanna um, welcome everybody here. If you have any questions, um, please hold them until the end. Um, Irene has a beautiful PowerPoint that she's prepared for us. Um, if you feel like you might lose your question and you need to type it up in the chat, that's okay. But just know that Irene will um, get to the questions. We'll get to them at the end of her presentation. And on that note, Miss Irene Dundas. Well, thank you, Colleen, for such a wonderful introduction. 
Well, my name's Irene Dundas. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the Aquan people for um, hosting the nights at the Egan Gunishish. Um, my name's Irene Dundas. I am from um, Cake. I am Zakwadi killer whale from the house that anchored the village. My father's people is Nehadi, so I am Nehadi Yatki, um, and I am a grandchild of the Tequadi. Um, tonight, I'll be presenting a little bit about repatriation um, of climb property, objects, human remains, relationships between tribes, museums, and much more. So my presentation is about 45 minutes according to my husband, which does not take time. <laughs> he tried to, and then he got caught up in the presentation. So um, it's about 45 minutes. So we'll go through. So right here we have in the pictures, it's a lot of pictures because I want to share, um, try to share with you my experience. Um, and there is a lot of details. It probably could have been an hour and a half but I had, you know, shrunk it down. So right here we have Dorica, um, we have Nathan Jackson and myself in the background, you could see Steve and we have Steve, um, Nathan's son. And in the middle is a totem pole of the, um, from the Cots hit, it's actually a house post. And then this is the Burke Museum off to the right, um, which is a totem pole um, that Nathan carved in a sculpture that his son Steve have has um, sculpted. Oh, okay. So I'm seeing a big. I see a panel here where I cannot read what is here. So I'm going to try to shrink it down. Okay, there we go. Okay, so NAGPRA, um, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Repatriation under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act allows tribal governments to have a legal path to seek control and custody over cultural items such as associated funerary objects, unassociated funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony and human remains. Um, we have um, repatriated all under those categories um, in the past, and hopefully we'll be doing more um, repatriation under um, sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony and associated funerary objects and unassociated funerary objects. In the background um, is Cape Fox Village. Um, this is a photo that was taken by Edward Curtis. Oops. Okay, let me see. Okay, there we go. Got to share. Okay, moving on. So brief history of um, Saxman and Ketchikan um, Clinkets. Um, the Sanyuquan people are the people of Cape Fox Village. And like Colleen said, um, the Tontaquan are people of the Tongas Village. Sanya meaning um, people of the Southeast Wind or the Southeast Wind people and Tan, um, Tanta is the um, sea lion people. So the Sanyuquan and Tantaquan united for education. In 1894, the Clinkets of Cape Fox Village and Tongas Village joined together and moved to Saxman, 15 miles north of their homelands. Sheldon Jackson and the Presbyterian Mission facilitated to build a school and church in a new location. Lewis Paul Sr., Samuel Saxman, and a man named Edgar died searching for the new location for both villages. The Tongas and Cape Fox Clinkets had been traveling to and from Port Simpson to get educated and learn of the gospel, which they had been doing so for 15 or for 17 years prior to their move. In 1899, the Harriman expedition explored Alaska for two months. The expedition brought along renowned scientists, artists, naturalists, and a photographer to document um, Alaska, and that was like John Muir, F.S. Dellenbaugh, Edward Curtis. In the summer of 1899, the Harriman expedition embarked near Cape Fox Village, where Edward Harriman, the railroad tycoon, suggested to have lunch on the white sandy beach of Cape Fox. At this time, Mr. Harriman directed the boat, the boat crew to dig up the totem poles and a whole house to take back to the States and donate to museums across the country. The effort was so strenuous, Harriman requested all the, gets of, 
all the guests aboard the steamer to partake in the looting of the village. Um, here is a picture of um, the Harriman expedition. In the background is um, Cape Fox Village. They're sitting on a beautiful white sandy beach. Um, Cape Fox, actually the place name is called Gosh, which um, translation is refers to powder. And if you've ever been to Cape Fox Village, the beach is like powder. It's like the white sandy beaches in Hawaii. Um, these are the items that the Edward or Edward Harriman and the expedition had taken. Um, starting from your, um, my left is um, a Nehadi pole that was taken from um, Kate Fox. It is um, at the top is an eagle, I believe a thunderbird and a beaver at the bottom. And at the very bottom is a young man. So this pole was taken to um, Cornell um, University in Ithaca, New York. Um, the next um, picture is um, of the totem pole off to the left um, where the bear is coming out of the den and at the top is a loon. So that pole was taken um, to the Harvard Peabody in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, the next picture is of an eagle um, both of, or there's two of these poles and their house posts. Both those posts were taken to the Smithsonian um, in the Bronx um, in New York. And that is a storage facility um, warehouse in New York. So it wasn't taken to Washington, DC. Um, the next photo is of uh, the Bear Clan house or the Hoots Hit. And this house had belonged to Chief Big Thomas or we are, which is my great, great grandfather, um, Thomas Johnson. Um, his clinket name is Stuckane. And um, he was married to a, um, my great, great grandmother, Steech, which is my grandma Martha's grandmother. So um, the totem pole that um, stands in front of it is the, is a, the Cots bear pole. Um, that pole was also taken to um, the Smithsonian in the Bronx, New York. So that totem pole actually stood outside for a hundred years. It was actually put up on, um, I think they made a stand for it. And um, so that was outside for 100 years. They didn't bring it inside, which um, was all right, I guess. Um, anyways, um, the next um, photo is um, a, a picture of many items that the Harriman expedition had taken. Um, we have not located any of those pieces as of today. Um, and in the background is a beautiful picture or a beautiful scenery of all the clan houses. Um, the next photo is of Edward Harriman and his wife and there's the other Eagle um, house posts and the sun, we believe they are sun masks. Um, we have not located those yet either. Um, the next photo is of um, the, the Cots bear house post and then you can see inside the mouth of the young bear cub um, is Cots himself and that actually there was two of those um, house posts and those were actually um, in this clan house right here. Um, those are at the Burke Museum. Oh, uh, the, the house that was taken from the Smithsonian when the Harriman expedition had taken that house, they not only took the front screen, but they took the floorboards, the sideboards, and the roof. The totem pole that stood in front of it, that was 42 feet tall, which is a pretty tall pole. So it was quite an effort to um, remove some of the, or actually remove all of those totem poles. Oops. So a healing journey to a full circle. In 1994, the investigation of the missing totems from Cape Fox Village began. And mind you, I was only 19 years old when we started researching um, the totem poles that were taken um, from Cape Fox Village. Um, in the back or in these photos, you see a picture of the census records 
um, death certificates and various photos um, I, I researched and got from the Alaska State Archives, um, from the Library of Congress, and from the Presbyterian Mission, mission in Philadelphia. Um, it was quite a, it was quite an investigation. It, that's what it felt to me. I felt like I was um, just investigating, investigating. Um, so, because all we had was um, really, we had this um, this book, a time remembered um, Cape Fox Village, eighteen ninety nine. This book was um, commissioned. Um, by Cape Fox Corporation um, and a man named John Granger had um, put together the book and it was in 1984 and it, it um, was a gift to the original shareholders of Cape Fox Corporation which was 198 shareholders and in 1984 we had a whole lot of elders alive and um, giving information and there is a lot of information that was put into this book. Um, my supervisor at the time, um, Doug Campbell, he was the CEO of Cape Fox Corporation, um, handed me the NAGPRA law, the NAGPRA Act and said, read this. So I read it about, I don't know, 38 times and and understood that we can get artifacts back from museums. This law allowed us to do that. And at the time, native corporations were allowed to um, repatriate. Anyways, he then handed me the book, um, The Harriman Expedition. And he said, read it. So I read it. And I learned that um, in 1899, the Harriman Expedition had taken totem poles from Cape Fox Village. Now, we had no clue that there was totem poles taken um, in 1899. All we knew is, you know, we moved from Cape Fox Village to Saxman, and um, that's the way it was. And so what I did is I went to the back of the book, and I had um, researched and looked for um, where these gentlemen were from, where um, F.S. Dellenbaugh was from, where Edward Curtis was, was, was from. And, you know, they were from Seattle and Chicago and New York and Boston. And back then, um, there was no internet. There was no um, 411 where you could call and dial and say, can I have, you know, the Chicago Field Museum or you know, a directory. Long time ago, you had to dial like 907-225-1212, um, or you wrote a letter. Um, and that is what I did. So I ended up writing letters to all the museums. Um, I ended up getting in contact with Pamela Harriman, um, who um, is, I think she was the great, great, great granddaughter married. Um, she, at the time, she was um, the ambassador to France, and I was able to contact her in France, and she linked me up with some of her um, stepchildren who gave more details about the Harriman Exhibition and what artifacts or what clan property that they had. Unfortunately, um, the pieces that they had kept um, burnt down in a warehouse. Um, it was like... Um, research to ad identify clans, clan names, clan crests, clan stories, and migration started at ground zero. The totems that were looted occurred 40 years before the elders of the village were even a twinkle in their parents' eyes. In 1994, we took an assessment of what the clan or what clans and clan members were remaining in Saxman and in Ketchikan and what, a, and what Quan they were from. Elizabeth Denny, Sonia Kwan Takewaiti, Esther Shea, Tanta Kwan Takewaiti, Mary Jones, Sonia Kwan Nechadi, Martin Perez Sr., Sonia Kwan Takewaiti, Dorothy Edderberg, Sonia Kwan Takewaiti. Those were the elders that were um, around in my time in 1994 um, that helped me tremendously research and gave information 
I was conducting interviews on a day-to-day -day basis to acquire as much knowledge as I could, um, as I knew um, time was not on our side. Um, this is an example of the some of the pictures that were put in the, the booklet, A Time Remembered, that Kate Fox had commissioned in 1984. Um, this is a a drawing, I believe that um, John Muir had did. And um, John Granger was diligent about drafting out the village of Cape Fox. And so off to the right, you see the layout of the village. And this does not tell me what clan, um, the totem poles, you know, who they belong to or things like that. So what I did is I took the one photo that um, was of the bear house and on that photo, John Granger had labeled um, Chief Big Thomas, which at the time in 1984, you had people like Martha Shields, you had Joe Denny, Joe Williams, Henry Denny, um, Emma Williams, um, Philip Major, Fanny Major, those people are, were around to be able to give Mr. Granger the information that is presented here on this slide. So what I did is I took the picture of the, the Cots hit, or not the Cots hit, the Hoots hit house, and you could see off to the right, there is a label that says Big Thomas from the eunuch. And John Granger labeled the photo Big Thomas. So I was able to match up that photo and the layout of the village and put um, all the totem poles in place. So I then created an additional map to this and then was able to track the clan houses and the totem poles that belong to those clan houses or to the clan. So right here we have um, Mary Jones. She is Sonia Kwan Nehadi. We have Esther Shea, who is um, Tanta Kwan Tekwedi. And we have Elizabeth Denny, who is Sonia Kwan Tekwedi. Now, Mary Jones was instrumental at helping doing the genealogical charts. She was very tedious about um, her family lineage um, into detail. She created several family trees for her family and she um, linked them up to the Ebbets family and the Kinnanook family. And also she's my father's people. She is Nechadi. Um, she had such extensive work that she tracked her great aunt who was taken to Carlisle, I believe when her great aunt was only about, I wanna say four years old or five years old at a very, very, very young age. And um, Mary actually went back several times to Carlisle to locate her great, great aunt, which she did not she was not able to, to find her because some of the graves were unnamed, um, but she was an excellent source. Um, she was also the same clan as, well, the Kinnanook and the Ebbets family. So when um, Captain Cook had arrived, first arrived in Alaska, the first um, village they embarked on was Tongass. And um, um, Captain Cook was, gave, that clan, the a pig and rice, and they thought the rice was maggots. And anyways, um, the clan actually adopted the pig as a clan um, and had a clan house that was named after that in to commemorate um, Captain Cook giving this clan um, such um, gifts, which the, the, the people had loved greatly and respected greatly. Now, Esther Shea, um, she was tremendous at um, documenting um, the place names. I don't know if you know that um, 
the southern southeast area or the Ketchikan area has the largest inventory of place names, Clinket place names in all of southeast. And this was from the work that Esther had done with the Forest Service and going over the Goldschmidt and Haas notes, which um, they documented the place names and named them in Clinket or wrote them in Clinket. And um, she translated them and documented it very, very well. She also um, was working with um, Mary Jones and Judith Berman um, to also document the, the family trees of the, of the Tontaquan. Elizabeth Denny, um, she's dear to my heart. Um, Elizabeth was married to um, a Nechadi of the Sanya Kwan. Um, he was the clan leader um, and she was very quiet, but she was sharp as a tack. Um, Elizabeth Denny not only remembered her clan families, Clinket names, but she said, it's my responsibility to know all the other people's Clinket names, which was, you know, from her village, which was um, the Nechadi um, and the Kiksadi. And she knew everybody's Clinket name. She knew her opposite clans, her husband's um, family's Clinket names, and she knew the Kiksadis, um, which is her great-grandfather's Clinket names. Um, and she knew many of the Tontaquan Clinket names. Um, I interviewed her once and I was like, Elizabeth, um, you know, I need to learn um, Elizabeth Long's clan family and she was like, oh yeah, you know, Elizabeth lived, you know, in Saxman years and years and years ago. And she, you know, went on about her clan and um, her Clinket name. And then she said, but she moved, you know, almost like, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And she said, but her phone number was 225-4846. I was like, Elizabeth, how do you remember any of this? but she was sharp as a tack. So from Elizabeth's um, information about Clinket names and Esther's knowledge of place names and um, Mary's knowledge of genealogy, we were able to take that chart that John Granger had did and put it all together and associate families and individual names and put them into their clan houses. So here's an example. And then Martin Perez. Oh, he's such a sweet man. So Martin, um, he's wearing a bear tunic and he has a, the bear shakiat on. So Martin, um, very kind, 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 sweet man. So he was a fisherman. So he um, would go out fishing with his uncles and um, he would say, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know much about my, my clan history and, you know, I can't tell you stories. Um, but he would tell me about his fishing adventures. Um, and one day I was asking him, I was like, you know, Martin, I, I need some information. And I know you talked about, um, Cheekat's Cove, that was one of your areas that you would go out fishing at. And can you please, you know, tell me a little bit more, you know, what your mother or what your grandmother had said. So Martin's mother was um, Agnes Perez and her mother was Annie Haldane and her mother was June Stosh or June Starish. And June Starish's husband was Clark Starish or what we are, his clinket name was Stoshed. And Martin said to me, well, you know what? I do know a little bit about, um, I do know a little bit about Cheekat's Cove. He said, my great grandfather Stoshed dressed in full regalia. So this is about 1900. Actually, it's like 1901 to be exact. Um, my great grandfather Stoshed went to Chicat's Cove 
to talk to his great uncle, which was Chakot. And Martin said, you know, it, it, it's not a happy story. Martin went on and he said, Shtash went up to confront his uncle Chikot because Chikot gave his land to the federal government. I'm sorry. And Shtash went to confront him and Shtash or Chikot was so ashamed, he shot his nephew. And Chakot then turned around, dressed himself in full regalia, and took his own life. Um, I know it's a, a, it's a hard story, um, but what I learned from that is, is that um, clan property and clan territory is very, very, very precious. That, you know, um, and also the respect that a person or a clan had for their own clan property and that they had to, um, that times were changing and um, they had no control over some of those things. So Martin ended up, you know, he told me that story later on, um, Martin, oh, so precious. Martin ended up, um, you know, passing away and he, he allowed me to be, or not allowed me, he made me the caretaker of the take weighty, the, the tunic and the hat he had there um, for several years. And then his, his family then um, ha now has it and they're now caretaking for it. So um, I love Martin and he has, he had wonderful fishing stories. So um, here's Stoshed in the middle here. Um, and then here are his sons, I, Jimmy and Charlie Star Starish. And then I believe the boy off to the um, off to the right is one of Charlie or Jimmy's children. Um, like I said before, um, we had to do intense research um, because we did not know exactly what the clan stories are um, of of the clan crests that were on some of those totem poles that were repatriating. So like I said before, we gathered um, census records, um, death certificates. Um, we have BIA um, enrollment records and we have Presbyterian mission baptismal records. We have cemetery um, like the plots, lots of photographs. Um, we have microfiche, we have tapes, and um, it was quite a research project. Um, and just a tip for people who are wanting to do some research that are from Alaska and Southeast Alaska. I don't know how it is conducted in other, in other areas, but from about 18, I wanna say about 1890 to maybe about 1820. Um, when you go into the Department of Vital Statistics, which is there in Juneau, this is a tip. Request for the front and back death certificate to be copied. Why? Well, because um, the front of the part of the death certificate obviously names you know the person who had passed away it names their mother father potentially the wife um where they had died um what they had had died of you know maybe it was um pulmonary heart disease or complications uh, syphilis tuberculosis smallpox um but potentially where they were born too um but in the back of the death certificate is, is tremendous information because the back of the death certificate, and they'll try to say, oh, you don't need the, the back of the death certificate. No, you need the back of the death certificate. Um, 
because in the back it will say other living relatives and the way so in about 18 or so 1900 to about 1920 and even further um, later on in the years the people knew their social structure they knew their protocols and so what they did in the back of the death certificates is they would name their closest living relatives and that would be usually the children mother father brother sister but then on top on the right hand side would be a test or um, the, a witness. And what they would do is if the clan, I noticed if the clan was um, take weighty brown bear, we know that's under the equal moiety. I noticed that the uncles of the opposite clan were named up on the top. And so they were also witnessing. So they took it even to death in, in 1900 and 1910, 1915. They listed and they were still going by a social structure and protocol that they had known that they were supposed to do. And so that allowed us to link more people together to these family trees. Also, another tip is um, the 1900 census records. Those records were done by Edward Marsden. Edward Marsden, like I said before, was um, he was Simshian. He was he was well educated. He was under the um, he was being tutored by Father Duncan himself, um, the 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 preacher who had moved um, the Simshian people from Old Metlakatla to, to to New Metlakatla. So he was under, um, kind of under the supervision of Father Duncan. Anyways, he went off to school. He became a preacher. He moved back to Alaska. He preached in Ketchikan or preached in Saxman, had a church in Saxman for a little while. But in 1900, the 19 or the 18, the 1890 census records are burnt. Um, but the 1900 census records are available. And what um, Edward Marsden did is he, since he knew the social structure, he knew the protocols, he was not only fluent in English, but he was also fluent in Simshan, Clinket, Haida, and Chinook jargon. And Edward Marsden had married a Clinket woman from the Tontaquan, the Tongas people, and he was like the informant. So he went throughout Southeast and in the 1900 census records, he went from house to house and he not only um, said, you know, head of household, um, clink it, but he said head of household, Sonia or head of household, Kate Fox. And then you would see like the wife would be um, wife, um, Henya. So they could have been Cloak. And then he named the children, you know, Hina, because they belonged to their mother, their mother's clan. And so um, Edward Marsden was great at um, taking in the census records for the 1900s because he was so detailed about the people. He even, so the 1900 census records also has everybody in Clinket names, which is amazing. So that also linked um, Elizabeth Denny's um, information with Clinket names to the 1900 cens census Clinket names. And we were able to link those up together too, which is amazing. So rediscovery. So established um, clan house names in Cape Fox Village, identified um, remaining clans of the Sonia Kwan, identified ancestors, clinket names of the Sonia Kwan, including Tonta Kwan names, researched and assembled 221 genealogical charts with some dating back to 1550. The, genealog the genealogy charts are broken down by individual clans and clan houses, linking present day clan members to their ancestors clan, to their ancestors clan and clan house. Identified and separated Tontaquan Takewaiti and Sonyaquan Takewaiti. Discovered Bessie Denny and Henry Denny tapes reciting the history of the Sonyaquan. 
Also, we um, had a, a massive amount of donations. Um, we have Martha Shields um, recordings and we had some um, reel to reel tapes that were also, or reel to reel films that were also donated. Identified additional um, place names, landmarks of the Sanyaquan and Tontaquan. And for example, is this tree of the cottonwood tree that is um, in Saxman. There are two of them. And Henry Denny Sr. in about early 18 or 1900, um, Henry Denny Sr. went to his homeland of the Eunuch or Junuk, Junuk River, and collected two saplings. Um, the cottonwood saplings, and he replanted them there in Saxman. Now, cottonwood is not native to Ketchikan. We're on an island. Um, so these are the two saplings that, um, actually, there's lots of sap, there's lots of kind of cottonwood in Saxman now because you know how cottonwood is. And in the summer nights, you have, you know, it's kind of enchanting where the cottonwood is floating around in the in the wind. Anyway, Saxman now has lots of cottonwood, um, but there's um, two of those trees and both of them have are actually both of them are protected because um, they both have eagle nests in them. Now, um, we didn't have to go this far to repatriate. Um, we could have repatriated off of just the Edward Curtis um, photos and um, some of the testimony that was done in the book that they were looting the village, but it was very, very important to um, the people at the time to continue to do research, to find additional information, and it, um, it, it was just very important. Um, because we were finding out all this information and they wanted to continue to do the research. So that's what we did. We could, we could have probably um, just repatriated all of them um, with a quick turnaround, but we chose not to because there was too much um, oral history and intellectual property that was shared. And we we're meeting with the elders on a day-to-day -day basis and how precious could that be? Um, I got to know them very, very well. So in 1899 to 2001, it's not exactly 100 years. Um, it would have been 100 years in 1999, but um, the ship that was supposed to return the items in 1899, um, there was like a, 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 what was it, a tsunami or there was a big, um, storm that happened in Asia and the, the ship ran aground and they had to regroup. So anyways, um, in 1998, Smith College announced that they were going to recreate the Harriman ex expedition, documenting scientific changes in Alaska over a hundred years. Kate Fox Corporation initiated consultation with Smith College to coordinate the return of artifacts that had been taken by the Harriman Exhibition in 1899. In 1999, Kate Fox Corporation partnered with Dr. Rosita Wuerl to draft and submit five repatriation petition of claims to Harvard Peabody Museum, Chicago Field Museum, the Burke Museum, Cornell University, and the Smithsonian. And right here is a picture. Actually, this is a, there was a video that was sent out by the Harriman Expedition Retraced. And this is um, my nephew. It, actually, he's not my nephew. He is my father. So this is Wushkina. That is the clan hat that my father, Wayne Shields, um, had gift or had given to um, Cameron Saluto. So he is my father. Um, so after that, the, the clans, the tribe and the corporation move forward in meaningful consultation with the museums. Um, off to the left is my uncle Harvey Shields. Um, in the back in the red and black is um, Terry Snowball. And the guy off to the, um, you can barely see, it's kind of a side face here, um, is Jim or James Pepper Henry. I believe he was um, the director for the Anchorage Museum for a little while. So anyways, those guys were um, the repatriation um, 
coordinators for the Smithsonian back in the day. Um, the man in the middle in the jean shirt is the man who did the documentary for Smith College. Um, who you don't see here is a, a man named um, Lars Krutak. Um, he is, he was just, he, that day he received a, a grant from National Geographic to do a um, documenting tattoos all over the world. And later on he produced and a series called The Tattoo Hunter um, that was very successful. Anyways, those fellows helped with the repatriation for the Smithsonian. Over to the right photo is a picture um, where we have Marilyn Blair, the president of Cape Fox Corporation, um, Harvey Shields, the um, Nehadi clan leader, and we have Wayne Guthrie, Takewaiti, Sonia Kwan, spokesperson, and Dr. Dan Monteith, who is also adopted by the Takewaiti of the Sonia Kwan. Um, Videoing at the time is um, President um, Joe Williams Jr. And then it was time to um, coordinate everything coming back home. So coordinating a smooth and successful repatriation took a tremendous amount of effort and support to pull off. So we had to facilitate and organize truck um, like truck drivers and containers to get to Ithaca, New York, to go to um, the Bronx, New York, to go to um, Boston, to go to the Chicago Field Museum, and then truck these large pieces. We're talking a 42 foot totem pole to have to go all across the United States to meet up with Smith College and a barge, which I don't know if it was AML or Boyer Barge back in the day, um, to meet up and get on those ships to get to Ketchikan. Well, the day that um, the truck went to Ithaca, New York to, um, to load the Nehudi totem pole, my Aunt Cecilia White had passed away. And um, my Aunt Cecilia was the oldest of her brothers and sisters. Um, she was Nehudi Sonia Kwan. And um, a couple days before that, she called me and she said, you know, babes, I'm going to come up for the, I'm going to come up for your repatriation. And um, I can't wait to, I can't wait to Indian dance and welcome, welcome those things home. Um, well, she ended up passing away the day that the, um, the truck had arrived in Ithaca, New York. Um, which was extremely sad. So then the, the clan had to deal with that because in Clinkett protocols, you know, that if, if your clan had passed or a member of your clan had passed that you have to, um, you know, respect that and choose not to partake in ceremony. So we had to get over, we had to figure out what we needed to do about that. Um, but getting all these items um, back home was huge. We had um, contributions from BP, um, uh, David Rockefeller, um, Bill Gates, Paul Allen, um, the Churchill family, and not the Churchill family in Ketchikan, the Churchill family, like the rich Churchill family, um, they all made donations and um, we were able to smoothly get everything back. We also had present NBC News, um, Chicago Sun-Times, and the New York Times to video and document um, this wonderful ceremony. So 100 years of healing. Kitty Harriman, the great-great-niece of Edward Harriman, gifted the Sonia Kwan a hand-sewn quilt that was created by, the Herman, by a Harriman relative back in 1804. Right off to the left, you could see um, Kitty and her new baby, myself, um, Rosita, and Eleanor. 
in the middle here, we have um, Charles Denny, we have Richard Dalton, and I can't see and make out who those folks are. They're celebrating and um, they are celebrating taking, not taking, um, receiving the the quilt that was gifted to them by the Harriman family. And there's myself um, with a closer photograph of um, the, the quilt they had given. Um, also at the 100 Years of Healing, um, like I said before, my Aunt Cecilia had passed away the day that they had, um, the day that the truck had arrived in Ithaca, New York. Um, my Aunt Cecilia also came back home the day that the Harriman Expedition Retraced arrived in Ketchikan and they had her laying in state there at the, at the ceremony. Um, so she was also partaking in the ceremony like she would have and like she had planned before. And she continued, the, the rest of the clan had continued to celebrate with her. Um, amends were made between the Sonia Kwan and the, and the um, Harriman family. And then by gifting that quilt was everything. Um, there was no more sorrow, no more hurt. It was done. Um, here's the Harriman Expedition Retraced. Um, this is on the village of, um, we're at Cape Fox Village here. Here's my Uncle Harvey in the middle. And this is um, the, the people that were at the dock re um, when the, the boat came in from um, Seattle with the Harriman Expedition Retraced. Oh, I'm sorry that this is a, a blurry picture. Um, on the right is my auntie, my auntie Sarah, my father's sister, um, Nehari. In the middle is Richard Dalton, um, Duck Dayton, and um, Tom Abbott, Shangu KD, and Phyllis Almquist. She is a head. And in the back there, you could see Chuck Smythe. Anyways, um, the clans of Kate Fox requested that. Um, Richard Dalton come down and assist in protocol um, because there was, um, they wanted guidance on how to um, go along with ceremony and they wanted the items to be received in their community correctly. And so um, the, the clans um, invited Richard Dalton down to, um, to be the Nakani. Here is a photo of some of the items that were taken, um, a totem pole. This is the pole. These are the house posts that were at the Smithsonian. In the background there, you could see um, the Hoots Hit that belonged to um, the Take Weighty. Here's my friend Kat. The loon that was on top of the on top of one of the totem poles. This is the pole that was at the um, Harvard Peabody. And in the back, I believe that, uh, I think that is, I, I don't remember. I don't remember what the totem pole is back, I'm sorry. But right in the back there, you could see this, the tail in those, um, the eagle, eagle, eagle claws. And then you see the ravens with the, with the spray. So, I don't, I didn't mention this in the beginning. In 1999, um, Saxman had a tragic loss. Um, Saxman, the, the community hall, we had record breaking snowfall and the community hall in Saxman collapsed. And so everything, you know, was all down to the ground. Um, but you know what, the, the things that survived were these panels and those panels, because um, when the people moved from Cape Fox Village and Tongass Village to Saxman, those, um, they painted these panels like in representation of their clan house. So that's the Eagle Tail House. There's other panels around the around the um, Ted Ferry Civic Center, but those survived, and 
those panels were there to welcome the cultural property that had just been repatriated. And so we put those up in the community or in the Ted Ferry Civic Center to welcome their clan brothers and sisters back home. It was pretty magnificent. There was a lot of people. I wish I could have been there for this part. I, I wasn't because we had to go down to Cape Fox Village to, um, to, to welcome the Harriman expedition onto the village, but they continued on with ceremony while we were down there. So it was full circle. Shortly after the 100 years of healing ceremony, Cape Fox Corporation reached out to each museum that repatriated Sonia Kwan and Clan, Pro Sonia Kwan Clan property and gifted the museums a red cedar tree as a sign of friendship and appreciation for caring for the precious clan property for over 100 years. Nathan Jackson, Clinkett Master Carver, was commissioned by Harvard Peabody Museum, the Burke Museum, the Field Museum, and the Smithsonian to carve totems from the cedar trees gifted by Kate Fox Corporation. So here we have um, a picture of Nathan, um, his wife in the back, um, Dorica, myself in the front there, and off to the side there you could see Stephen. Um, these are the, this is the off to the right upper corner is um, the totem pole that Nathan had carved and the sculpture that um, Stephen had sculpted. And here is the totem pole that was, or the house post that was um, at the Burke Museum. Now there was two of them. Um, and yes, um, let's see. So here is the totem pole that Nathan had carved for the Smithsonian. Um, this is the pole. He did not make exact replicas. Um, so the house in the back and see that totem pole right there in the middle, that is the Cots, um, the Cots bear pole or the three bears and, and Cots and on top is the loon. So um, the Carving in the middle is um, done by Nathan Jackson and I believe I want to say that totem pole in the middle there off to the right is the um, the take weighty pole that was um, in the Smithsonian. Here is the Harvard um, or here is the take weighty pole um, that was um, caretaken by the Harvard Peabody Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, it, it, you can't see it closely really right here, but it's actually shaped, kind of shaped like a, a copper tina. Um, so in the middle there is a bear cub coming out of its den. That's actually um, Elizabeth Danny's clinket name, Kuduk. Bear coming out of the den. Um, on top is the loon and um, off to the right is the totem pole that Nathan had carved um, for the Harvard Peabody. Um, here is um, the Peabody drafted up a beautiful um, write-up and history of um, the relationship that Kate Fox Corporation, the traditional clans, had with the Peabody Museum off to my right or off to the right is Rosita and Nathan and they are um, talking about the the history and um, the ceremony. That was a beautiful beautiful ceremony back in um, in Boston. And the Peabody. This totem pole not only represents the Sanya Kwan Takewaiti clan and their history, but revitalizes the relationship between the Sanya Kwan and the Peabody Museum. There is off to the far left is um, the CEO at the time, Diane Palmer, myself, Esther Shea, um, Richard Shields is my uncle, 
Rosita and in the back you could see my cousin Gail and um, Willie Jackson. Now this ceremony was beautiful. Um, later on that day we actually went to a really fancy restaurant in Boston and we had to eat really proper and everything but it was fun. Um, let's see. So the pool in um, Ithaca, New York, the one that Cornell University had had, um, that totem pole, which is also, I don't know if you guys have been out to Saxman, um, there is the Eagle Beaver Hellebit pole that is out there. This is from the same clan. Um, Cornell chose not to um, recarve a new pole but um, this totem pole actually stand, stood um, almost for a hundred years. And over the years, it was painted pink, it was painted gray. Um, there was blue, like bright blue paint. There was clubs that came and painted on it, like the women's club or something like that, um, and just painted it over the years. Um, when we received this totem pole, it was broken in like 11 pieces. Um, Here's Nathan carving on uh, the totem pole that was um, that's now in the Chicago Field Museum. I wish I had the original um, photograph that was or the original picture of the pole that was at the Chicago Field Museum. Um, that totem pole stood in the main hall also. Um, Chicago Field Museum is the museum that has the big triarn, um, the triarn, tri or T-Rex, <laughs> had T-Rex in the middle. And um, anyways, um, we repatriated that totem pole, um, but I could not find a picture of that totem pole for some reason. Um, but this picture, um, these pictures are of the new pole that replaced the pole that was at the Chicago Field Museum. Um, that actually got a lot of um, publicity. Um, I was interviewed by the Sun Times for this for this repatriation. So I'm going to wind down now. Um, there's just a little bit more. So relationships with the tribes, the museums, and much more. So it was much more. Not only did we. Um, Cape Fox Corporation and the clans and the tribes build a wonderful relationship with the museums it was a lot more. Um, discovery of additional clan property in museums and private collections allowed us to reconnect clan members to, to, the, to strengthen, um, oh wait, reconnect clan members to strength of our ancestors and culture, helping to process historical trauma, created learning opportunities for clan members and individuals to seek their traditional history, to empower them with the strength of our ancestors past, present and future. Created an additional platform that allows tribes, clans, museums and federal agencies to collaborate and conduct meaningful consultation and help one another understand their internal process in turn leading a path to understanding our cultures, both Western and traditional. Backed with ancestral knowledge allows clan leaders, tribal leaders to tell it like it is. Like my son would say, dropping some knowledge. <laughs> when meeting with federal, state and local agencies for issues regarding protection and sustaining our way of life. So these pieces, like I said, it, it allows us to research further um, and other repatriations that are, you know, that can be potentially repatriated back home. Um, the top left is the, um, a Thunderbird hat that is owned by the um, Tequiti of the Sonia Kwan. The Copper Tina, I believe is also of a Thunderbird. That is also owned by the Tequiti of the Sonia Kwan. Down on the lower left is the Sea Bear. Um, that is owned by the Tantaquan Tequiti. Um, in the middle here is 
the killer whale hat, which is owned by the Tontaquan Takewaiti. Now this hat is ancient. Um, this hat had come down the Nass River. It's now in um, Calgary, Canada. Oh, the top hat, the, the Thunderbird hat is in the Denver Art Museum. The Tina is in um, the New York Metropolitan Museum. Oh, I forgot where the, the um, sea bear is at. And the halibut, um, that is not in a museum. That is, um, it's not in a private collection. Um, there is a little story behind that. So the halibut hat is Nechadi. And um, about in, I wanna say 1918, um, Charlie Brown, who is Nechadi, Sonia Kwan, um, in that era, in 1918, 1900, you know, um, the Native people were feeling a tremendous need and an urge to be educated. They um, were sending their children off to schools. Um, well, some were being taken, but some of them willingly allowed their children to go off to schools and to boarding schools or to go off to college. And Charlie Brown, um, he was the house leader, a house leader of his clan or of, of his clan house. And he had received this hat from his uncle. And he says to a, a gentleman here in Ketchikan um, who owned a store, um, he said to, actually the store owner and Charlie Brown were good friends. Actually, Charlie Brown is also the man who recarved the Seattle totem pole um, that's in Seattle now. So anyways, Charlie Brown was good friends with a store owner here in Ketchikan. The store owner was also a minority. Anyways, um, Charlie said, um, I want to sell you this hat because I see that our clan and our, our ways, our clinket ways are being diminished. Um, and I need to send my children to school. Will you please purchase this hat for me for $1,200? And so um, the, the Japanese store owner had agreed to purchase the hat for $1,200. And Charlie Brown was able to send his children off to school. And Charlie Brown then goes on to explain um, in a letter to the store owner, um, the history of the hat, um, when he got the hat and what the hat was intended for. And so um, I'm hoping um, not this year because of COVID and all that junk that's going on, but um, I would like to gracefully chat with the, the family and um, hopefully with honor to the family that caretake for the, the hat and to the, the clan to reunite them and bring out the ceremony because they also, this family also has a beautiful legacy in Ketchikan um, and a beautiful um, relationship to the native community in Ketchikan even today. And um, I'm hoping that we can, we can reconnect them and then we can get, um, we can get the hat and dance and ceremony. And that's a new story to tell among the other story that already, or uh, along the story that already goes with the hat. So crossing my fingers. So not only did we um, do repatriation from this, um, I'm wrapping up here pretty soon. Um, we also were able to um, connect history. So this, this particular slide has two subjects to it. So one was um, my daughter had come back from 
being away for a little while. And she had decided to come to work with me. And um, I tasked her to read through the Ronald Olson notes, or those might even be the Garfield notes. I don't remember which ones they are. And she was tasked to um, look for anything that said um, sea bear, sea monster, tired wolf, um, killer whale of the Tongass, of the Tontaquan. Um, because we were trying to locate um, additional information that went to the killer whale hat that you see off in this older picture far bottom. Um, the hat that is the sea bear, I showed you that um, picture before, you know, in the prior slide. And there's a couple other pieces here that, um, that she was trying to link up. And at the bottom there is the Kajuk bowl. Anyways, um, in the back, you could see the top, there's the, the kill, well, they look like killer whales, but actually those are sea monsters. And in the, also in the far right of that, or the far left of that picture, you see a house post. That's a tired wolf house post. Those actually, this clan house um, was my father, my grandfather, Albert Shields's clan house. So anyways, we identified um, some of those pieces that are now in the Cooperstown Museum in New York. And up at the top is a photo of the Mybridge or a picture that Mybridge had taken. What was it in 1870 something? Anyways, he, taken, he took this photo of um, people in, in Tongass Village and you see the circles around there. Those, those photo that photo actually has um men with those hats on that we found in cooperstown in the cooperstown museum so then we were kind we could kind of link that up to be kind of saying that that's potentially the same clan that is in the um tired wolf you know, belonging to the same sea monster house or the tired wolf house, um, all the same clan. We didn't necessarily find all of that information, but what we did find, which was precious, um, Alice Harris um, had explained when you smoke fish, you, um, you know, you cut it down, looks like she cut it newspaper style right here, which I can't do. And I love cutting fish um, and I love smoking fish. Anyways, um, she had explained that the bear clan, when you're, you know, because Clinket people went off to their summer camps to go get fish. Anyway, she explained that when you're, you know, you the, the fish is out like this, you put three marks on it on the upper part, probably where the, um, the jaw is, or the collar, you put three marks, that's the bear clan. And then off to the right is um, the raven clan, which is a star or an X. And then it goes on to explain that um, the eagles, which is the Nehudi, put also an X, but put it in a different place, which was cool information to learn. Also, this same research project which was um, very intense. Um, the day that she's sitting in this photo um, was December 23rd. And at four o'clock, I get an email or Ketchikan Indian community gets an email from um, in a roundabout way, the state of Alaska. And the state of Alaska then says to KIC, um, which is the tribal government of Ketchikan, you know, it's Ketchikan Indian community, says to KIC, um, we want to do borehole drillings and we want to give a permit to a, a, an LNG company out of Canada. And so um, th where the boreholes are going to be is on Sit Clan and Kenaganut Islands. And the LNG company is out of Canada um, the LNG line will run through Canada all the way down to Tongass Village, which is the last part of Alaska that makes Alaska part of the United States because up there is Portland Canal. 
So you have a line that would be run all the way down under the, under the water over Sit Clan Island, back under the water again, and then up over Kennegut Island and be on the outer part of Kennegut Island. So we had to do tons and tons of research because we're like, Kennegut Island, you know, what's that? Well, in this research, we find out that Kennegut Island, Sit Clan, and Tongass Island, which is just right there, um, that area is the original, original home to the Tontaquan. Now, we know that the Tontaquan or the Tongass, the whole Tongass National Forest is named after these people. So we then had to draft up a letter at the like ninth hour. Now is um, December 24th and the, um, the letter is due, I believe it was December 26th at, I think I wanna say at 12 noon, we had to make our opposition to the state of Alaska for um, to running the LNG line and to put an LNG facility. I wanna say it was at least five miles long on the outer part in the water, not on land, in the water. So we had to make our opposition last, you know, last minute. So we wouldn't have been able to acquire that information if we were not able to have gotten that information prior to all the research that we had done for all the other repatriations. So that was very, very um, critical. Um, right here we have um, Richard Jackson, Tantaquan Takewaiti, James Lano, Sonia Kwan Takewaiti, and George Ridley, Gunahuddy Tantaquan. He's now passed. Um, we have uh, Harvey Shields, Nate Huddy, and we have Nathan Jackson. Now that um, piece that he has, or that's on the table there, that is a part of a Bentwood box that was donated um, to the clans and Nathan is trying to draw out what is on that um, Bentwood box. And so we have the clan members behind, I believe that Bentwood box had come from Walker's Cove, which would make it take weighty. So also it allowed, so all the repatriation, all that history also allowed for the community to become more engaged. It allowed us to um, want to learn more about who we are. Right here we have my uncle Clarence Jackson and my uncle Joseph Thomas or Joe Thomas. And at my house we had um, a dinner and we had a name giving. So our clan um, has not had a kui in many years. I mean, I think we had one when my uncle Clar my uncle Clarence has one year, um, or we did. We I don't think we did. Anyways, um, my uncle Clarence flew down, and um, he had adopted and given clinket names to all the folks around the table, and we did it at our home where we also had it um the the opposite clan was present so we were able to take care of clan business and not wait for a kuik or a potlatch because sometimes that could take a long time and he wanted to get it done because he wanted to have his grandchildren belong and that's precious um so there was a yearning for, for more information. Um, right here off to my right is um, my niece, Mariah Shields' post, and she's letting me know on social media. He was really listening and watching. Thank you, Auntie Irene, for all the hard work. Um, we appreciate you. Gonna listen to this all the time. So in the middle there is my little nephew, Grace and Percy Nix. Um, and he is listening to a YouTube video that I had sent to Mariah about the Sonia Kwan Nehari Halibut. Now, Mariah 
she's 21 or 22. I don't remember young age. Anyways, she was was um, living me with me for a little while, her and her sons. And she was grumping around the house and she was time for her to cook. And I put on my computer and um, I had these recordings of her clan history. And I'd say, you know, Mariah, you need to learn your history. Um, you need to learn the Nehuti history. And of course, you know, 21 year olds, 22 year olds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes, oh, do you listen to that all day? I actually, you know what? I do listen to them all day. I listen to them several times a day. And so I stuck on the video for her or the recording. She didn't care. But um, later on, I then sent her a link to YouTube. And um, she then now has her boys listening to the history of their clan on a regular basis which is precious because that's what we need. And I am one of those aunties. I will be like, now listen here, um, Mariah, this is what you need to do. Don't back talk me, whatever. Um, but I will egg and egg and egg and I will put it in her face that that's what she needs to do. She doesn't argue, but anyways, well, sometimes. Um, so here is a um, young couple um, my friends, um, so Christian, um, the gentleman in the back, um, they just received, um, his full clan history of the Sonia Kwan Takewiti, and you could see all the papers here, that's how extensive it is, um, lots of triangles, lots of circles, um, linking all back to the clan house, there is some clinket names in there, and they're really getting into it right here. Um, and their children, which um, is a precious picture. And K KIC purchased a whole bunch of these t-shirts to give away to as raffles for um, to the children. Because we want to start a movement. Teach me my history. You know, um, catch a can. Uh, right now is having issues with the school district and that's a whole big other big ball of wax that I don't want to even get into so anyways um they're having issues and KIC challenged the youth of Ketchikan to wear these t-shirts they were gifted out and we want to create a movement so there's one day that we request all the tribal members to use these t-shirts and so here's some of the the kids there's my son in the middle there's my nephew Troy and so last very last there's only one more slide after this. So um, this is the Eunuch River. Over here is um, on both sides is the Forest Service. So the Eunuch River, um, I don't know if you are all aware of the transboundary mining issues, but um, there is potentially a mine that's going to be going up 60 miles north of the Eunuch River. The Eunuch River is the host to one of the largest king salmon runs in the world. And um, the KSM mine wants to mine, and this mine is, I think they said it's as large as three Hoover dams. So the Eunuch River um, is very precious to our people. Um, and the Eunuch River gave, um, so our, our leaders have to go and speak to like the Transboundary Commission to say protect the Eunuch River. They go um, consult with the state. Um, anyways, the people like um, our tribal leaders, um, not only the clan leaders, which help with giving additional ammunition to the tribal tribal leaders because government to government, the government only speaks to the recognized tribe, which is, you know, Ketchikan Indian community and Saxon IRA. Um, this information that we had collected from all the repatriations gives additional ammunition to the tribal leaders like the Gloria Burns, the, the Robbie Sandersons, the Fred Olsons, the Richard Petersons, so that they can go to um, the tribal or the Transboundary Commission 
or to when they're meeting or not even meeting when they're on a on a plane and they're going to DC and they are trying to um, inform them about the Unic River. It gives them ammunition to say that this is the the river that um, the traditional people of the of this area have have owned. Also, the Unic River, the the Clinket name for the Unic River is Junak, which means to dream. Now, there's two stories behind that. Um, one, the, the man had um, dreamt of the Unic River. And then the other story is, is that in, I want to say in 2005, um, the, we had repatriated the woman shaman of Duke Island. And um, she was in Chicago. And um, we had went through all the consultation. It was very intense. We didn't know what clan she had come from. And in Clinket ways, you have to know exactly what clan the shaman is from so you could have that particular clan go and assemble her to bring her back home. Anyways, it was very difficult. I ended up flying to um, California to interview one elder and the elder said, yes, I know of Duke Island. Duke Island is the um, belongs to the Ganahadi of the Tontaquan and all the ravens bury their people there. Well, oh my goodness sakes. So anyways, we still didn't know if the woman shaman of Duke Island was raven, eagle, bear. So it was, I've seen a video or there was a program on National Geographic that had the Chicago Art Museum had it just purchased an infrared camera to take pictures of, a, of art or a, some sort of piece from China that was taken um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. In any ways, the infrared camera was used to make out the image that was on that Chinese piece. I called Helen Robbins from the Chicago Field Museum, asked her, please, can you go and borrow that infrared camera from the Chicago Art Museum and take a picture of that apron that the shaman was using when she was taken? So they did. The picture came out clear as day. There was a raven on that apron, and it was like, okay, she's Ganahadi, and we're going to repatriate her as, you know, Ganahadi, and we'll link up all the clan members. And usually there is no women that go to these, um, you know, for, for shamans. Um, my, I did attend um, because I was the repatriation manager, and then we invited Colleen. Um, she is Ganahadi, and the woman shaman of um, Duke Island, her clinket name was Junak, and she was a song composer. She composed, I want to say, 108 songs for her people. And what better than all to put all that together? And Colleen came. And she was like, Irene, I was composing a song. And oh my goodness sakes, she composed a song for Junuk. And um, which makes it all so relevant because a year after we repatriated her, um, we put her back where she had, had come from. And then about a one, one year later, the Forest Service calls again or writes a letter again and says, Ketchikan Indian community, I want to inform you that there is a company that wants to do mining on Duke Island. Duke Island is a little tiny island behind um, Annette Island. And they wanted to do exploratory drilling. And we were like, oh my goodness sakes. So the Forest Service, not the high ups like the Denny B. Shores or the Beths or the, um, the Forest Coles, the worker bees, like these guys that are at the table here, John Autry, they said, um, they, came to the, they came to KIC, we're doing meaningful consultation. And, and then they said, well, why don't KIC and the Forest Service do an MOU, get together, and why don't we, um, petition or propose to make Duke Island 
a traditional cultural place, which is a TCP. So we did, we got an MOU together and we had um, put the proposal to SHPO and um, KIC and the Forest Service contracted Dr. Priscilla Schulte and Dr. Dan Monteith to draft up the cultural significance of Duke Island and the surrounding islands. That's Duke, village, cat, and dog. And they drafted up a wonderful pr proposal, submitted it, it was granted. Duke Island and the surrounding islands are now um, considered a traditional cultural place. And um, that was a success. So um, they could still mine, but there's a little bit more um, barriers that would have to happen before that even happened. So the last, our ancestors are still guiding us and speaking and speaking through us in 2020, and they will continue to do so for the next seven generations and the seven generations beyond that and so on. So our people and our ancestors are still helping us in this day and age. And here we have this young lady who, um, you know, has this, the missing indigenous women sign across her face, my son, which I love dearly. I'm one of those moms, I have the only son in the world. And my two girls, Marlena Dundas and Dorian Dundas and Marlena, or Dorian is holding on to my niece, Jasmine, as they're dancing. And so that's my presentation. Um, is there any questions? Now let me go to open this up. Phew. So I would encourage Thank you. Goodness, Chish, I really did so good. Phew. Okay, there we go. Go ahead. I need a drink of water. That was a lot of talking. I think someone had a question or a comment. Right. Well, <laughs> I can see everybody thanking you in the comments there. I don't know if you are watching the comments, Irene. Um, I can't. I just have the screen really big so I could see all your guys' <laughs> faces. It'd be nice if I could, if you guys could turn on your cameras. <laughs> you certainly can. Oh. I don't know if you caught it, Irene. Uh, we just wanted to give you a big old Auckland goodness cheese. You did so good. We're in our jam, so we're not going to turn on our cameras. I'm sorry. Okay, it's all good. <laughs> it was great. It's all good. Nice. Oh, that's my cousin from Cake. And my girls are on. Thank you, girls. So, any questions? I know it was really, really long. There is so uh, much more. Yes, Rolanda. Irene. Hi, this is Rinalda, and I just wanted to um, thank you so much for your time this evening. And um, my takeaways are just affirming what we know of the importance of our histories, our language, our art, our relationships, our laws and protocol are what keep our 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 cultures alive and thriving. Um, and I wanted to footnote too, I am Te Khoedi, and my mother is, um, was recently given an additional name. Her, her child name is Jigekla, which was somewhat of a prophecy of mother of many that she lived up to that with, our, with her nine children. And most recently she was gifted the name um, Junakla, um, oh. the um, mother of Drew. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, oh my. Yes. I'll probably have to connect with you later on so I could 
dig around and find more information. Mm -hmm. yeah, we originate from Angoon. Okay, uh, gotcha. Um, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. Really appreciated it and enjoyed it. Yeah, so thank you for being here. Okay. Anyone else? Hi, Alex. 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 Yes. Alex. Alice Taff here in Juneau. I want to thank you for your visionary work and um, your uh, powers of endurance mm -hmm. to do all that you have shared with us this evening. I know that you have been working with other people, so I thank them too. <clears throat> and um, the, the way that you handled that you showed us how the return of the polls has been handled to um, give respect to those people who had the items for so long is um, a model for the rest of the planet. So we learn so much from you and the people here about how to behave and get along with the world. It was a big effort. At a young age, it was, it was a really, really big learning curve to understand. I mean, I was 19 years old. Actually, I you know, 19 years old, taking on such a heavy and big task when I seen, I seen the whole, oh, it gets me. Um, it's almost like you see in front of you, the seven generations. Well, I did. Um, and, and that I was actually wanting to go into the Seattle Art Institute or I actually enrolled in, um, in the Air Force. And um, when I noticed that we only had the five elders in my, you know, that I can count on my hands, my whole life changed from there. I, I couldn't go back. I couldn't stop anything to, I couldn't even leave to go do anything else because my heart yearned just to to know more because i didn't know what else to do so you got your art and your wings in a different way absolutely absolutely Are there are any other questions comments Thanks for letting us know you were doing this. Yes. Thank you for the um, deer meat. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy tomorrow. Yes. Oh, yeah. My husband's making, he's like the fried bread king. He loves making fried bread. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to have Indian tacos with the, with the deer meat. I just uh, want to make a comment. Your uh, the picture you had with the village and then those clans on there for each one of them is uh, awesome. It'd be awesome to see that again. Um, if you put it out anywhere or share it anywhere, that would be amazing. Okay, which one was it? Was it the? It, it was the picture, and then on the side it was uh, the drawing with all the. Oh <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was awesome. The one with Cape Fox Village. I do have, so I have the one that was done by John Granger. I have the picture that I think was done by John Muir, the, the drawing. And then I, I guess, transposed and drafted up a, an additional one where it has all the villages or the whole, all the um, houses with all the totem poles that aligned with it and the house names. So I do have that one. I 
So I'm in isolation right now. Actually, today's my last day. Um, I was exposed to somebody who had COVID. And so today is my 14th day and I'm allowed to go back to work because I'm negative and I'm able to get more information. So I did this whole entire slide presentation without any um, documents that were at my work. So I will have to get that and I can get that to you. All right, well, I think we should wrap it up for this evening. Thank you everyone who um, joined us for evening at Egan and Irene, I hope you'll return in the future. And yeah, thank um, you thank you again so much. Yes, good night. Good night. Thank you, Irene. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay.